So thank you all again. Um, so we're going to just go through a quick agenda for our presentation today, Understanding Logic Models for Community Food Projects. Again, I'm Kristen, the National Technical Assistance Manager at New Entry Sustainable Farming Project. Um, and I work with our national team, um, one of the projects of which is to provide training and technical assistance for applicants and grantees of the Community Food Projects Grant Program. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about uh, new entry and what we do and the technical assistance we provide for CFT applicants and grantees. And then we'll uh, shortly hand it over to Cultivating Community and our partners who are presenting the content of this presentation today. Um, again, Leslie Kaiser and Craig Lapine from Cultivating Community. And then we'll have some time at the end for any questions. So a brief bit about new entry. Uh, we have on the ground work and programs that we do here in Massachusetts with farmer training and food access. We have a farmer training program, which includes a business planning course and an incubator farm site. Um, also, we operate a food hub, which has a CSA as well as food access initiatives, primarily for uh, senior centers and other community organizations in the Lowell, Massachusetts area. On the national side of things, um, I personally work with our national team, and we provide training and technical assistance uh, for incubator and apprenticeship projects, uh, so focused on beginning farmer training programs across the country, um, helping facilitate a network of those kinds of organizations. Um, and as previously mentioned, we also work with applicants and grantees to provide training and technical assistance for the CFP grant program. And so New Entry received a training and technical assistance grant from the USDA to support applicants and grantees of the CFP program. Um, on our website, which is indicated on this slide, we do have resources and other webinars that we share in providing this training in TA. Uh, we also do one-on-one -on -one assistance. And you can feel free to reach out to me for any further questions um, about our offerings. Um, as you may or may not know, the Community Food Projects Competitive Grant Program is a, pro a program of the National Institute of Food and Agriculture through USDA. It's a program that started in 96 to fight hunger and promote self-sufficiency in low-income communities. And here are the goals of that program, primarily around uh, self-reliance and empowering low-income communities and making sure they can meet the food needs of their communities. Um, so just wanted to give that brief overview um, of new entry and CFP. Um, logic models, I will say briefly before turning it over to Cultivating Community, um, are a part of the application for the CFP grant program. So if that is something you are interested in applying for, um, I will mention CFP is um, aiming to release their RFA this year uh, at, during a similar time as they have historically released their RFA, which is usually around mid-October. So it looks like their timeline will likely be the same for this year. And again, logic models are a part of uh, what they identify in the RFA that you will need in order to submit your application. Um, they refer to it largely in regards to evaluation and uh, that they, they say or what was included in last year's RFA was that evaluation should focus on logic models, um, which is an attachment uh, that is a, a piece of the application process. Um, and so it's recommended that applicants uh, ensure that they have a logic model um, to, again, kind of feed back into their evaluation plan. Um, so I'll, I'll leave that there and go ahead and turn it over to Leslie Heiser and Craig Lapine with Cultivating Community to talk a bit more about understanding logic models. Thank you so, Thank you very so much. much. 
Kristen. Kristen. We have a little bit of an echo here, so um, I wonder, is it better? Yeah, it's better now. That's good. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everybody. We are very excited to be with you on this journey um, so that we can all feel confident and feel like we understand logic models. Is the audio, can you let me know if there are any issues for them with the audio? Wow. Okay, it sounds like the audio is all right. Um, so my name is Leslie Heiser and I work here at Cultivating Community. We are in Maine and um, we have a farmer training program at the new entry. We also have urban ag, as I know many of you do. We have food access and we have youth leadership development through a food lens. And we have garden-based education for elementary school students. And now I'm gonna introduce my supervisor, Craig Lapine. His name is actually pronounced Lapine and let him talk for a moment. Um. Thanks. Um, yeah, and our, our work is, is really focused on the idea of making sure uh, healthy food is available to everybody who wants it. And if, and if the way that we get, that we achieve that is through people growing their own food, we have programs, as Leslie described, to support that. And if people just want to eat the food but not grow it, we also have programs to support that. And we've been doing our work uh, based in, in Portland and Cumberland County and Androscoggin counties in Maine since about 2001. Great. The first thing that we want to say about this presentation is that we want it to be really clear and really accessible. And one of the reasons that we're having two sessions as opposed to one session, which we did do in 2015, is that we would like you to go ahead and type in any questions that you have you know, that are significant to you rather than just feeling like you have to wait till the end of the presentation, because that can be a very long time. And since this is a technical subject to some degree, we want to just invite you to go ahead and share your questions and we'll try to address everything as we go along. So we have a presentation here that we're going to be sharing with you. Um, and there's also going to be a display of a sample program focus in a logic model. So some of you may have three or four um, different things that you do that you would like to have funded by CFP. Like you may have urban ag, you may have a youth program, and you may also have food access. Today, we're not really going to cover that kind of, you know, multiple focus. What we're going to do is present what the logic model is, what it looks like, how it works. And our example is going to be a single program, which is going to be urban ag or community gardening. Okay, so I'm seeing that there are no questions, and so please advance the slides. Okay, this is what we're going to achieve by the end of this, understanding logic models, no problem. Okay, next slide. Okay, Craig, why don't you present that? Sure. So a logic model is really, and the way we use it internally, it's a visual presentation um, that links the theory of change underlying your program with its outputs, outcomes, and impacts. So in other words, it's how we present um, how the world currently is, the, the, the world that we are trying to bring about uh, the impacts, and all the steps that get us from one to the other based on our theory of change. In other words, what are the what are the mechanisms that we think will take us from the world that we're in to the world that we're trying to create? Great. So a couple of things I'd like to point out is when we say outputs, outcomes, and impacts, those are three different kinds of results. They're results that are broken out in the logic model. And then the other thing I want to say is if you don't know what theory of change is, don't worry, because we're going to be addressing that. And so, Kristen, I think this would be a great time to take a quick look at the sample program focus in the logic model.
Okay, great. Thank you so much, Kristen, for doing that. So as I mentioned, the example that we're sharing with you today is community gardening or urban ag. And then uh, you'll see that we also call that non-commercial food production, making a distinction between that and our farmer training program. So um, hopefully this resonates for many of you. Now, the first column of the logic model is kind of different than everything else in the logic model because um, it applies, you've got to imagine that there are other rows beneath community gardening. And imagine that there are two or three programs that you're actually carrying out. So this column, this pink column, is about the conditions that you're working with in your organization. And it's not spatially correlated with the rows. In other words, everything in that column kind of applies to each program focus that you may have, whether you have one, as we do here, or whether you have three, or whether you have four. So basically, the pink column, the situation, is kind of the pros and cons that you're dealing with. And I don't want to get into, it, into too much detail, because this is really just a glimpse, but I wanted to show you um, what we were going to be talking about before we launch into the discussion. Um, the next column is your objectives that you have inside of your program focus. And then we move into your activities, the things that you plan to do. And then we move into your output. And um, it's very important to understand what outputs are as opposed to outcomes, but we will be covering that. The outputs are the things that your organization commits to doing. Specifically, how many participants are going to be benefiting from this program, and how many program modules or whatever are you actually going to offer. So the activities kind of explain what you're going to be doing. The output quantifies that by um, explicitly stating how many units, how many weeks, how many months, how many classes, and very important, how many people. Because this is really what the USDA is going to be funding you to do. Um, and, and then to just continue with the distinction between outputs and outcomes, and if you can just take away one thing, I would say this might be it. Output is what your organization is going to do. It's the output that your organization is going to have when you get this money and when you do this project. Outcome is changes for participants. So you can see that who is being indicated in the outcomes and the outputs is totally different. Output is your organization. Outcome is your beneficiaries, your participants. And then the last column is impact. And this is a very nice column that um, is really about the long-term effect that you hope to have in your community. And you don't have to demonstrate in your evaluation that you accomplish the goals that you put down in impact. And um, I refer to the Kellogg Foundation Handbook on Logic Model Development, which I think we're making available to you. And they say that impact can be things that occur seven to ten years down the pike. So that's something to keep in mind. So I hope that that gives you a little bit of an idea of what this thing looks like. And um, I don't want to go into too much detail, but does anybody have any questions just based on this? Okay, great. So let's go to the next slide, please. And then we'll go on to the next one. Okay, what is the logic model good for? Now, Kristen articulated what the goals of CFP are, and I hope you'll see that many of the benefits of using a logic model um, are very much uh, in sync with the goals of CFP, which is probably why they're requiring a logic model. <laughs> so, um, Greg, let me know when you want to dive in. Okay, so 
community development. So what Craig and I are going to present to you today is the idea that when you do your logic model, you know, a couple of really important things are to leave yourself enough time to do it so that you can involve a lot of people, ideally stakeholders in your work, the people that you co-create with, your participants. Um, so actually having a logic model design process is a wonderful excuse to invite people to come together for an afternoon and to eat food and for you to listen as they tell you what their goals are as a community. And you know that pink column that runs vertically down the logic model to tell you what they feel their resources are, the things that they already have, and also what their needs are, what their issues or problems may be, or the things that they simply lack. So a logic model process can bring people together, including and especially stakeholders. Craig, would you like to? Yeah, and I, I just want to say, uh, Leslie had already referenced this concept of a theory of change, and this is a great moment to vet that with your community. Um, you know, you may be in complete agreement with others in your community about what the um, what the circumstances are, what the assets and challenges in your in your community are. And you may have an idea about how to impact those. Um, and it's a good moment to share those. And, and other people may have a very different idea or, uh, you know, an opportunity to say, that's actually not going to really help people in my situation, but this would. And, and the logic model, of course, is the place where you present that information. Here's the current situation. Here's where we're trying to go. And here are the interventions between here and there that we're going to do. And, um, and it's a great way both to vet them and have people give you feedback and also um, get community buy-in. If, if people do think it's a good idea, uh, then it's not just you and your organization thinking about those things, um, but it's the broader community, which the, the USDA really does want to see. Um, they, they, I don't know that they use this particular nomenclature anymore, but they used to talk about having, um, having a community-based projects as opposed to just community placed projects. They really want uh, projects that are integrated with the fabric of a community. And Craig reminded me that there was actually something that I wanted to do that I didn't do. So Kristen, would you mind um, showing the, the sample uh, logic model that we have just, just for a second again? Because I didn't have a theory of change um, illustrated by the logic model. Sure thing, I'll open that again. Thank you so much. So, 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 so you have change. What the heck is that? Well, the idea is if you start with a pink band, you can read the logic model from left to right with an if-then model, and that is your theory of change. In other words, starting with the pink column, if you have these community assets and you also have these community challenges and you pursue these objectives and you conduct your activities and you hit these outputs, this is what you're going to be delivering, and your participants gain as indicated by your outcome, then you will move towards your community impact. So it's kind of if, 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 then. So the whole thing makes sense from left to right. That's the theory of change. You're basically saying to the USDA, hey, here's all our conditions right here in pink. Here's what we're dealing with. Well, if you give us money so that we can do this, and um, and we do it, then you're going to see these outcomes in our participants, and, and we're going to move our community towards these impacts. So I hope that's clear. Thank you, Kristen. Sure. Okay. So, um, so that's 
checklist. Uh, one of the other things that logic modeling is good for is consensus building among staff and others. And I'm sure you may have experienced a time where there was a little bit of dissent among your staff after a grant gets written or maybe while it's getting written. Uh, maybe the development people want you to do something that you don't want to do or, um, you know, who knows what's going on. But we know that grants uh, can be a source of tension in an organization. However, with logic modeling, um, instead of having a lot of tension and anxiety around the grant writing, what you can do is bring everybody together around the creation of the logic model and have the conversations that you need to have so that hopefully everybody will agree on, um, on what you all are going to be doing and what commitments you're going to be making as an organization and what you're going to be trying to achieve. So instead of having a lot of anxiety around grant writing, instead you can have a lot of positive energy around logic modeling if you leave yourself enough time. Okay, and then effective planning. Well, um, the logic model really is a plan. And um, it can be an integrated plan that if you do have two or three or four programs going at the same time, it can incorporate all of them. Um, and that's really all I can say about it. It basically is a plan. But it's not just a plan of action. The outputs commit you to your deliverables, and the outcomes commit you to what changes you expect to see in your participants. So it's, it's planning, but it's planning with all the results laid out. Okay, Craig, would you talk about the next one? Sure. Um, so I think, uh, I, I guess I'll jump to the basis for evaluation. I think from the USDA perspective, that is pretty key. Um, and it's a great moment to also think about. We know you know, many of us are trying to achieve um, these very lofty impacts related to uh, food justice and greater food security in our communities. Um, you need to make a decision in putting your logic model together. It's like, what are we going to accept as evidence that that's actually happening, that we are moving in that direction? Um, and so when you have to commit to those outcomes, these are the changes we're going to see in our, in our community and in our participants. Um, you really want to pick something that is measurable and that you have a plan for measuring because that is your evaluation plan at that point. Right. And that links to the one that Craig skipped, monitoring and strengthening implementation. It's amazing, and you know, um, I'm surprised Craig skipped that one because <laughs> when we got CFP, what he did was he made an enormous copy of our logic model and he put it on our kitchen wall. And there you go, that's how we're monitoring and strengthening implementation. And because we had effective planning, everybody is committed to our logic model, and yeah, we can just slap it up on the wall, and when we have a staff meeting, we can talk about it and say, how are we doing? Um, so it's very, very useful for implementation and keeping tabs on your commitment. All right, so let's get down to number six. The logic model is really, it's your theory of change. So you can really use it to um, tell great stories about yourselves and your clients and what everybody's up to and just promoting your organization in the community. Um, you know. I'm sure that we all know that it's very important to tell deep stories as opposed to sort of just cheerleading about, about the small things. Cheerleading about the small things can be good, but you also want to get your basic fundamental narrative out there so that people understand what kind of work you're doing and how you're going about achieving your goals. And your logic model can just be a great uh, touchstone for that. And then number seven, um, it's also a baseline for your next program model. When you, when you go to do this again, um, you, you've got your previous logic model. That tells you what your template has been for the last three or four years. Um, and, and for those of you who have had uh, CFPs in the past, if any of that, you, you know this. I mean, you know, one thing 
that the USDA doesn't want to do is necessarily fund the same activities over and over again, and they talk about, you know, sustainability of projects. Um, and that is all well and good, and those impacts in that far right-hand column are, are nothing typically that any individual organization uh, is going to be able to achieve in a three-year period. They are really ambitious uh, ideas about how your community can be transformed. And so um, if that is still acting as your kind of north star that you're navigating toward, your next project or another a project that you bring to another funder or what you're building into your own strategic plan that has nothing to do with funding necessarily, um, it can still keep you pointed in that direction. Absolutely. And, and I want to tell you something that we did here that actually has worked pretty well for us. Um, our organization is, is really entirely funded by um, grants and donations and a little bit of earned income. Obviously, the revenue generated in our programs goes to the farmers. So we do write a lot of grants, and a commitment that Craig and I made to our staff is that we wouldn't commit to any outcomes and outputs that were in addition to what was in our CFP logic model. In other words, if you, if you write a CFP logic model that incorporates all of your program, as, as ours does, and if you're fortunate enough to get it, as we were, or even if you don't get it this year, you're going to get it next year, hopefully, um, you can use that logic model as a basic template for all of your grant writing, and then you know, it really, it builds confidence in the program staff that the grant writers are not, are not sort of running amok and, and making all these commitments that they don't even know about. Not that that ever happened here. <laughs> okay, let's go to the, let's go to the next slide. So, principal strengths of logic model development process. And there's a couple of these. So we're really trying to sell you on doing this, in case you haven't noticed. Um, so a good, we've already alluded to this. Hopefully this is, a, this is going to be good reinforcement. Good logic models support an inclusive process in which you welcome your stakeholders as co-creators, co-managers, and co-evaluators of your program. You want to add anything, Craig? All right, great. Does anybody have any questions about that? Let's just take a minute and pause. We did get a couple of questions um, in the chat box, uh, and uh, I thought maybe we could address that now, if that's all right. Um, sure. sure. I'm sorry, I think you didn't see those. Okay. That's okay. Yeah, I think one came directly to, to me, but um, one of them was, does it matter if logic models are charts or graphic with images? I think that you should, I think you should avoid doing anything fancy or unusual because it's really, uh, it's really a demanding thing for somebody to look at your logic model and try to understand what you're saying because it's so compressed. There's so much in just the page. And so I think following the format that, um, you know, I, I'm not saying follow the format, but following something close to our format that doesn't have any bells and whistles, I think will be a lot less. Great. Um, and then one other question. Um, is will the, will your second webinar address the logic model for a grant proposal that has a multiple program focus? Yes. In in the second uh, session, what we're going to do is we're going to look at our BFRDP project, which has which is integrated and has uh, I think three program focuses. Um, another question just came in, what is the best strategy for starting a logic model? Where is the best place to start? Um, yeah, I don't think there's, there's, this is, there's not necessarily a one best place, but I think one of, the, one of the things that we often think about is 
um, you know, what is the world we're trying to create? Think about that far right impacts column. Where where are we headed? And that can be, and then working backwards, well, what what steps could lead us there? Right. I think I think before question, you had also said that that yes, start with those impacts on the far right. How would you like to see your community change over the next seven to ten years? And then you can go to that pink column, the conditions. And that's where you list your resources and strengths, the things that you have going for you, and then also your challenges, your community challenges. And then you can do the goal, which is the next one to the right. What would you like to try to achieve? But, you know, you might be a person who's really into metrics, and you're all about the outcome, so you want to start with your outcome. Um, or you know what your organization is capable of doing and what it can do, so you want to start with your output. So I think it depends maybe what comes easiest to you, but I think if, I think Craig is absolutely right that impacts kind of come easily to everybody because we know the dreams and the visions that we have that are motivating our work. And I, and I do think, and I, I do think there are multiple entry points um, and going with what, what gets you out of the blocks is fine. And, you know, sort of be wary of the, you know, the, if all you have is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail scenario where if you limit your thinking by what you're, what you're currently doing or what your, uh, what you, yeah, what your, what's easy for your organization, um, I think it's, it's often the case that, um, you know, that community members and funders can, can see through that, but that's not, um, that's not really about what's best for the community, that's about what's best for you. Okay, I lost my screen. Oh, here we go. Okay. So, um, let's move on to the next slide. Awesome. Um, so, here's another strength of this process. Developing a logic model is an opportunity to become more conscious about your work, to create an explicit understanding of your challenges, resources, and timetable, and an integrated, commonly held vision of the commitments you want to make and the results you want to go for. And hopefully by now you know that commitments are your activities and your output, and uh, the results that you want to go for Focus in on your outcomes. Okay. Kristen, do let me know if there are any more questions. So we all know that we work really hard and we do all these things and we're very active and we're very committed. But it's true that sometimes being more conscious can help us to be more effective and to be more present and to enjoy what we're doing more. Um, so it's great that we have this tool for developing this little this little graphic um, that can actually um, help us achieve a new level of awareness of what we're doing. Okay, let's go to the next one. Okay. Here's another strength. If you include authentic stakeholder input in your process, you will design a model that is more likely to be relevant to your community persuasive to funders and successful on the ground. So by convening people in this process, you're going to really greatly increase your effectiveness. I hope that's clear. Okay, next slide. Okay, mistakes to avoid. Uh, outsourcing the process and or having an overly staff-driven process. Hopefully that resonates with some other things that, that Craig in particular has been saying that um, the whole purpose of this is to bring people together and create a common shared voice and a common vision and to make some commitments together. So the last thing that you want to do is have your development director and your executive director hold up uh, writing your logic model. And likewise, you would not want to ask a consultant to do it, I don't think. 
And then um, another mistake to avoid would be viewing the logic model as a tool for fundraising and not understanding its role throughout the program life cycle. And as we mentioned, it's very much linked to planning, it's very much linked to implementation and monitoring, and it's very much linked to evaluation. So don't, you know, when you get your CFP grant, don't forget about your logic model because that's what got you the grant and you want to you want to look at it all the time. Yeah, I and I just would add one word to that second bullet which is a tool solely for fundraising. It is it really can be an effective tool for fundraising but because it has clarified your thinking and presented a really bold vision that other people will want to get on board with but um, but then you have to use it as your roadmap for implementation as well. Right. So I got feedback that one person was hearing a lot of static on our end. I don't know if that's a general problem. I, I only heard that feedback from one attendee so far, um, but hopefully it's sounding clear enough for, for other folks. Um, okay, so we, made, we made a few ambient changes, so hopefully that'll help. Oh, we have a truck going behind us right now. <laughs> Thank All you. right. Okay, great. Let's move on if there are no questions. Okay, so components of logic model. I think you guys already are starting to get this. Uh, there's no one way to create a logic model. The way that I, I taught myself to do this is I read the Kellogg Foundation Logic Model Development Guide, which I think Kristen has made available to you, and it's um, 80 or 90 pages. And I read it for about three years, <laughs> and I sort of finally got more confident about this. Um, but that is a great place to look if you have an affinity for this and you want to know more about it. or if you want to um, learn about different ways of organizing your logic model, but what, we're, what we are sharing with you today is what enabled us to get our CFP grant. So please, please know that. So we already mentioned this next point that we read the columns in the logic model from left to right, and that's our theory of change, and that there's this one strange column which is resources and challenges, these are the conditions that we're dealing with, and um, they're not organized to line up perfectly with the elements to the right of them. They're just kind of true in general for the whole logic model. And I have found that you can use the material that you put in this column to craft your int introductions and your statement of need because they're your challenges. And even your impact can be um, inspired by what these uh, resources and challenges are. Okay, let's go on. Next column is objectives. And um, this, is, this is one that's definitely worth your time. It's definitely worth slowing down and getting everybody to really think. What specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely goals do you plan to achieve? And um, I will say that um, not all uh, logic models described in the Kellogg Foundation Handbook um, articulate objectives, but I think it's valuable to do because objectives is definitely something that you have to write about in the CFP grant application. And I also think that it's very grounding for everybody to think about the goal and what what you really think you can achieve and want to achieve. So for us, that is column three. So program focus, um, resources and challenges, and then objectives. And and of course in the RFA and Kristen went over this at the beginning. Um, the the USDA is. Um, is completely clear about what their objectives for CFP is, are. So um, if you develop your objectives and they're not 
at all aligned with those, it's a good moment to check that. And if they're not aligned, then maybe this isn't a good uh, funding source for this particular project. The degree to which your objectives are aligned with the really, you know, big needles that the USDA are trying to move, then that's what they're trying to fund. Right. And I think, Craig, that you might agree that on the other hand, to some extent, you don't want to overpromise in in defining your objectives because, well, I mean, having gotten feedback on grants from the USDA, I know that one thing that they consistently do is they tell you when they think that you said you could do something and they decided that you couldn't really do it for whatever reason. So, so it's important to to stick to that, um, you know, attainable, realistic, but have it be in harmony with the goals of CFP. Okay, next. All right, this is very important and I've already said it, but I just want you to memorize it. <laughs> Outputs are your core commitments. They are what your organization will do in exchange for the money that you receive. They offer a bird's eye view of what will happen on the ground. And I just want to say for us, sometimes we we name the activities as part of the outputs because that's what we're going to be doing. Or, or, or your outputs can be your participants. There's no sort of one way to do it, but just understand that both activities and participants, these are your core commitments and these are your outputs. In your participant column, you should definitely be delineating exactly how many people will be served in each activity and how many activities there will be, how many workshops, how many classes, how many teaching hours. So it's where you get, it's where you get really um, specific about what you plan to do on behalf of your participants, uh, what you're going to be offering, and how many of them you expect to reach with this programming. Okay, so we can move on. Um, so the outcomes are your changes for your individual participants. This requires you to think about metrics, um, outcomes, you know, when you get a major USDA grant, you measure your outcomes quarterly and you report on them. Um, right, Craig? Uh, CFP actually gratefully, I think, is annual. Oh, great. <laughs> I didn't know that. Okay. That's wonderful. So, so you'll just be doing that annually, but you'll, 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 you'll want to check in on this question of outcomes probably before the end of your first program year, just so you can see how things are going. Um, so, um, how about if people, how about if we do something a little bit more participatory? How about if people type in some sample outcomes that, that they achieve in their organ, that you achieve in your organization or just simply that you can think of? How about, a, how about let's get five to ten examples of outcomes? Kristen, are people adding outcomes? Hello? Hi, sorry about that. I was still muted. Um, yes, I've got, I see a couple um, have come in. The number of participants who can write a food-related business plan. That's one. Um, there was an earlier one here. Uh, number of new community gardeners recruited. Um, and to scroll through here, um, to eat more fruits and vegetables. Okay, let's, okay. let's just let's stop with those three and go over them individually, and Craig and I will comment. So can you go back to the first one? Sure. Um, I, let's see, I'm trying to recall which one I 
which I said I think first. the first one I said was number of participants who can successfully craft a business proposal. Do you want to comment on um, So that one, I think it's got some good components because what that's about is what the participants can do and not what your organization can deliver. So whatever programming your organization delivered, it created this fact that the participants now do something that they couldn't do before. Um, that is that is the outcome. I, then the next step would be to put a number on it. Uh, you could sort of quantify how many, like how many business plans are created or uh, because there's still that decision about what are you going to accept as evidence that that is true. So maybe right. it's that you have those business plans in hand. Or that, and then I think you probably, you don't want to imply that 100% of your participants will be able to do that because it's probably not going to happen. So you could put a, a, a metric on it like 80% of program participants will be able to craft a business plan by December 2020. Um, I think that's a I think that's a good outcome. And so I think to generalize from that, skills assessment uh, and skills self assessment, if that's the way you're going, are definitely both outcomes. Like in our pharma training program, the farmers take an elaborate skills self assessment at the end of every season, and that is a major outcome for us in our beginning farmer program. So I think that was a very good example. Okay, um, do you remember the second one, Kristen? I believe it was uh, to eat more fruits and vegetables. That is definitely one as well. I mean, that's what's known as a change in behavior. And um, I think that um, it's definitely an outcome, and we have definitely used it. The problem is a little bit, or the challenge is, how are you going to demonstrate that that is so? And again, you don't necessarily want to imply that 100% will be doing it, because we know it's very difficult for people to change their eating habits. But yet, you do want to suggest that your program is going to be effective, so you might want to hit that 75 80% um, when you're expressing your outcome. And then in the application itself, you'll have to say how it is that you are going to measure this increased um, consumption of fruits and vegetables. And obviously, you're not going to be monitoring people, so it's probably going to be some kind of self-report in that example. Right. And, and self-reporting is particularly important you know, if your baseline data isn't great. So if you don't know what people are doing today because you haven't been funded to do this work yet, for example, um, it's hard to make the case that, they, that there's been a behavior change unless the participants are telling you themselves. Right. Right. Any more examples, Kristen? This is great. Yes. Um, another is the number of new community gardeners recruited. I don't agree with that because that is participants, so that is an output. Right. Or yeah, let's yeah. I mean, right. So so that is, you know, a good, you know, something good to think about when you're thinking about outcomes is if your organization can control it pretty much 100%, then it's probably not an outcome. It's an output. Um, the, there's the effort that you are exerting, that's your output, and the outcome is what you're hoping to see. So I, I can understand where somebody would think that recruitment, that, that if somebody signs up for something that they've changed, you know, if you sign up for something that you've never done before, you've changed, but actually that's probably not what we're measuring. We're measuring changes that occur during the program experience. So I do think that was a really interesting suggestion, but I think that recruitment is kind of like a pre-program activity, not a program activity. Um, and and, it, and there's no, uh, uh, 
it's it's a tough one. But do you feel pretty confident with that, Craig? Yeah, I do. I mean, it's 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 on the pathway. Yeah. But there hasn't necessarily been. Well, I don't know. And and every community is going to be different. Different. Yeah, I mean, maybe for you that's extremely meaningful. Maybe maybe that is something to just delve into and think about and consider. Um, we typically have have made those commitments around participation as a component of output. All right, another example, Kristen? Sure, another example is increased confidence in preparing and tasting new vegetables. What, preparing and what was the second part? Preparing Sorry? And, and tasting. Tasting, tasting. yeah. Um, and, and, you know, that's, that's definitely a change. Like when people start to change their taste and, and feel more skilled in the kitchen and feel more desirous of being in the kitchen, that's a huge change. And then, um, you know, as, and, and I think it gets to the heart of CFP goals for sure. And then the question would be like, what are you going to propose in terms of how you measure it, which doesn't go in the logic model. Um, it goes in the grant application. Yeah, but that's, that, that is a good one. I mean, it sort of line, if you, if you say, so here's what we're going to do. Our activity or our output is going to be uh, 25 community-based cooking and nutrition classes. Uh, we're, exer we're exerting that effort. And then the outcome is that, you know, people are demonstrating more confidence in you know, and, yeah, more confidence in consuming and preparing those vegetables. That's great. And then that, you know, it's the it's that mystery of how you you know your it, your exertion creates that change or co-creates with your participants that change in the world that they are then reporting. Yeah. Okay. Let's do one more example, and then let's see if there are any questions or comments. Do you have one more, Kristen? Sure. Um, one more example is. 50% of interns who go through the internship are planning on buying farmland to produce local food. Well, I think I think that um, I think that it's definitely an outcome. Um, the only difficulty that I might see is that ones like I'm never going to buy any land because I'm never going to have that kind of money, and and that's not really what CFP is measuring is financial capacity. So, I mean, it might be it might be um, might be a little bit more in alignment if, with CFP if you said accessing land, because um, because there are ways to access land as we know that do not require do not depend on the capacity to buy land. Um, so the part that worries me a little bit is that is that um, the, the the whole land buying piece. You could also maybe express it without getting into the land access issue, uh, talking about 50% uh, of interns um, plan to produce food as a vocation or an avocation. What do you think, Craig? Yeah, I mean, I would say it, it, it certainly, you know, passes muster as an outcome. It is, it is a, it's something that has changed in participants, not within the organization. Um, and then, yeah, it will be up, I guess, up to applicants to decide whether it, that's, you know, that that aligns closely enough with what the USDA also wants to see change to, to fit here. But yeah. I would say it's definitely an outcome. Definitely an outcome. Okay, any uh, questions or comments or requests for clarification or anything else right now? Okay, great. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and, and Kristen, do let us know if anybody wants to jump in. Great. So, logic models commit you to effectiveness via outcomes. Although there are three kinds of results, as we know, outputs, outcomes, and impacts, 
Your commitment to program effectiveness is expressed in your outcomes because the impacts typically cannot be measured within the time frame of your project. Outcomes are expressed in metrics. It takes a while. Oh, oh, here's the, here's what we just did. I was <laughs> I was going to ask for examples, and I already did that. All right, so I think we can move on from there. All right, um, considering the rows in a logic model, we've been talking about the columns of the logic model, but read each row from left to right. You can have a row for one or two or three or maybe even four program components with an if-then perspective to understand the theory of change that is being expressed by the logic model. And, and we explained um, we explained that before. Let's think of a really simple example that's not even about the food system. So, um, so we could think that the pink column would be rocky ground, um, intense heat, and then some of the good things would be nearby aquifer and good level of groundwater, which I guess is impossible in the desert. Um, so those would be our conditions. And then our objectives would be to grow, what's that New England plant that we've all been talking about? Pawpaw. The pawpaw. Grow the pawpaw. That's our objective. And then um, our activities would be um, whatever we were going to be doing, like um, um, ha uh, what would they be, Craig? Having having a weekend having a weekend pawpaw growing session with a pawpaw experts and community leaders to. Um, motivate people around bringing back this wonderful shrub, tree, right. and, whatever it is. Right, and then there would be pawpaw tastings. Oh, right, and pawpaw pawpaw tastings, and pawpaw recipe generation, and yes, pawpaw storytelling maybe. <laughs> and, then, um, and then we would move into the participants and we would commit to how many people would come to this marvelous weekend. And then, we would devise our outcomes, how we wanted people to change, but we would have to know in order to do that, we'd have to know how we were gonna measure that change. Those would be our outcomes. And then how having pawpaws in our community would change our community, that would be our impact. So you can see that it's an if-then model, moving from left to right, if, this, if these are the conditions, and if we do this, and do this, and do this, and do this, then we will arrive at our impact, and that's our theory of change. And, and I, although I think, what, and what this slide actually I think we're, we're, is talking about is if we've got multiple areas. So let's say in some of the examples that just came up in outcomes, um, if we think about those, you know, backing up a little bit, if you're trying to create, um, you know, greater food access and food security in your community, um, part of your strategy might be around people growing food. Like we heard someone present an outcome related to people growing food. That could be one of the rows. Part of the part of your programming and your strategy could be about getting people to change their tastes around local food. So there could be, that could be another, um, another row in your logic model. Um, part of it could be about uh, impacting public policy so that you can have more farmers markets in your community or more farm stands. That could be another row. And they would just stack up and they're all kind of pointing in the same direction you're trying to move your community toward the same outputs, but it may be different parts of your staff that are working on that, or some might be owned entirely by your organization, whereas others require a, a, a sub-award or a partnership with someone. Um, but I think that's when you could get into it, and as long as I said, this will be number two, but where you get into a multiple row example. Right. And, you know, community gardening is the row that we showed you, and that's pretty obvious. But sometimes your rows are less obvious. For example, in a beginning farmer um, program that we were fortunate to be funded for, which we're going to be discussing in our session two, one of our rows was um, outreach to ag service providers in Maine um, to better capacitate them to collaborate with farmers of color and farmers from immigrant communities. 
And that, that's not something that is a direct kind of bullseye program focus for us. Uh, but that's what we decided that we wanted to do. And sometimes it can work really well, I think, to make your application more interesting to have like one program focus that's a little bit more nuanced and surprising. So it doesn't just have to be your basic core program. It can be something else as long as you think you can deliver some output and as long as you think that your participants will change as a result of the experience. Okay, let's go ahead. All right, I actually think that we already talked about this, but um, this, there's actually different approaches to logic models, and if you're a big geek like I am, and you decide to read that Kellogg Foundation handbook, uh, you'll read about different approaches, and I've kind of um, encapsulated what they say here for you. So um, the theory-based approach is built from big picture thoughts and ideas. It emphasizes the theory of change, the if-then approach, that has shaped the concept for your program. It illustrates how and why you think your program will work. It's very effective for planning and fundraising. Other approaches are activities-based, which is really useful for program management, and outcomes-based, which is really useful for evaluation and PR. But the theory-based approach incorporates all these perspectives. So, in other words, when you look at your activities and your participant columns, that is what is going to enable you to do the program management. And when you look at your um, outcomes and impacts, that's what's going to enable you to do your evaluation and to do a fabulous job with your PR, telling the world um, everything that you're achieving. Any questions? Okay, great, let's move on. Ah, Craig, this is the, this is the point that you made at the beginning. Um, if you're having trouble getting started with your theory-based model, draft the impact that you hope to achieve on the right. And then Craig said you, you could start with your goals on the left, your objectives if you want to, or you could even go one column further to the left and list your resources and challenges. Um, and I think we've already talked about how that might be a less intimidating way to get started. So I think that we have nine minutes remaining. I think that's it. Is that it, Kristen? Yeah, that's right. We were going to go till 3.15, so there's some time for questions. Yeah, so, so please go ahead and, and type your questions. I think to go back to that very intriguing suggestion that, that recruitment numbers could be an output, I think maybe one problem with that is that is that you wouldn't really be able to show outcomes related to that um, related to that output. Um, it's only when the participants participate in the program that the outcomes are going to emerge. And uh, we do have a question that came through. Um, how is this better for stakeholders than a PowerPoint? Well, a PowerPoint is kind of top down. If you're showing a PowerPoint, you're doing a lot of talking. And I, I guess my question about a PowerPoint would be, how are you going to turn the tables and get everybody else talking? Yeah, I, I, I guess, adding on that, I guess what I would say is that the, I mean, a PowerPoint could be fine. A completed PowerPoint or a completed logic model is is a product, um, and I think what we're what we're hoping to illustrate is what is what is the process or what is the process that gets you to that product? Um, and that it can be an opportunity, 
um, as developing any product could be, but, but this could be an opportunity for really um, having a community-engaged and stakeholder-engaged process uh, to get to that statement of here's where we're headed and here's how we're going to get there. So, so yeah, the logic modeling has strength as a process that that a PowerPoint doesn't have. And then if you're thinking of delivering or sort of like delivering the PowerPoint in your community, then, you know, for one thing, I mean, a lot of people don't read at all. Um, a lot of people don't read English and a lot of people don't follow PowerPoints very well. Um, so, so you might really be limiting your audience. Great. Uh, we have another question that came through. When you have several programs within the organization, do you do separate logic models for each program so that each one is a separate grant request, or can they be bundled? They can be bundled, and I think that CFP is a real opportunity to, to take an integrated approach and to get funding for more than one of your programs, right, Craig? Absolutely. And, and if we're talking about CFP in particular, um, you can't have more than one, uh, you can't submit more than one application. So if there are multiple program areas, you can make a case that they are heading in the same direction in terms of the impacts, um, and you want them all funded, you know, by CFP, then you, you would have to bundle them. Um, you know, and conversely, you could also, if you were willing to sort of apply sequentially, um, focus on one area with USDA funding for, for three years and then shift, that would be the other way to do it. Yeah, and we're all saying, we're all saying bundling, but I think what we might mean is stacking. So you can stack the programs in your logic model. They are broken apart, but they're contained in one model. Um, th this is, you know, a potential benefit for, for stacking or bundling many programs um, is people may be aware that the USD, that, that CFP in particular requires a one-to-one -one match in funding. Um, if you're trying to make a case for an integrated uh, community food security impact, let's say, um, and you've got three different ways that you work on that. You know, I, I went through that, you know, some is focused on food producers and some are focused on consumers and blah, blah, blah. Um, Maybe you've got another funding source for one of those. Um, it's very helpful in terms of your match to then build that in sort of as some of the outputs and outcomes you're going to try to achieve um, and say, this is part of what we're going to do under our CFP, but we don't need your money for it. We've got the money for it. Um, and that can be, a, you know, that's a good way of getting to your match. And it may not be actual money, right? It may be in-kind contribution. Oh, absolutely true, yeah. And I think most, um, yeah, I think most uh, community food projects grantees that I'm aware of, it's pretty unusual to have all of your match as actual cash. I think most people rely, at least in part, on in-kind matching. Like your volunteer hours and partnerships that you don't pay for, Exactly. Great. I think that's a great point about how it can help with the match. I know that's always um, a piece of the application process that can potentially be tricky. Um, so I don't see any further questions. Um, folks are free, of course, to continue sending them in through the chat if you do have more. Um, I did want to just take a brief opportunity to uh, remind everyone of this Logic Models Part 2 webinar, which is going to be coming up next week, um, which will be CFP Logic Model Examples and Q&A. So that will be on July 20th, also at 2 p.m. Eastern. And as this is a two-part series, we highly encourage everyone to uh, join that one as well. 
to kind of get the full picture of logic models and how it can be applied to your CFP projects. So just pausing in case there's further questions. Um, but it looks like that's it for the questions at this time, unless there's any final comments from Leslie and Craig. No, no, thanks, everybody. Um, I hope it was helpful. I think our uh, our email addresses may be available on one of those slides, but in any event, if anybody wanted to, you know, follow up in any other way, we are open. See you next week. Wonderful. Well, thank you again to Craig and Leslie from Cultivated Community, um, and we'll be following up the webinar with a link to the recording as well as some of the resources we talked about today. Um, and yeah, hope to see everyone next week. Thanks.